welcome everyone to our last current legal problems lecture of the year. My name is Sylvia Chateau. I am a lecturer in public law at UCL Laws and also one of the editors of the COP series. Now, my role tonight will be to introduce our chair, who will then introduce our speaker and moderate the post-lecture Q&A. But before I do that, I need to um, let you know that you can um, leave questions during the lecture as well as afterwards in the Q&A box that we have. So the chat function is, um, uh, is not active, but we do have the Q&A box uh, ready for your questions. You will also know that the session is being uh, recorded and the recording of tonight's lecture will be made available on the UCL Laws YouTube channel in due course. And finally, that the written version of tonight's lecture will similarly be available at the end of the year in our um, CLP journal that OUP put out. Um, without further ado, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our chair tonight, Karen Monaghan, someone who will hardly need an introduction um, to most of our audience tonight, but nevertheless, uh, a few words on Karen. She is a QC with Matrix Chambers, where she specializes in equality and human rights law. She has built a broad practice um, encompassing public law, employment law, as well as civil actions, and she regularly um, acts and conducts and advises on statutory and non-statutory inquiries and investigations. She has appeared before uh, many appellate courts, including the UK Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, the Court of Justice of the EU, and the Hong Kong Court of Appeal and Court of Final Appeal, um, and somehow also finds the time to publish academically while also being a panel member of the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission panel of preferred counsel. So I'm sure you will agree that there is no one better uh, suited to introduce our speaker tonight. Without further ado, Karen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. That was a very kind and generous introduction. And I'm absolutely delighted to have been invited to chair this event. I'm looking forward very much to the lecture. I'm going to say a few words about Shreya first before I ask her to uh, begin the lecture. Uh, first of all, Shreya is an Associate Professor in International Human Rights Law at the Department for Continuing Education and the Faculty of Law at the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights. She's editor of the Human Rights Law Review and official fellow of Kellogg College. Her research has been principally in the sphere of discrimination law and feminist theory, poverty and disability law. I'm going to come back and say something about her book in that context in a moment, her brilliant book in that context. She was braced at uh, the University of Bristol. She was previously a Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence, Hauser postgraduate, uh, post uh, postdoctoral, forgive me, Global fellow, fellow at NYU School of Law. And she completed her BCL with unsurprisingly a distinction and a DPhil in law on the Rhodes Scholarship from the University of Oxford. So extremely accomplished. She's one of the leading new scholars in the field of equality law. So I'm particularly pleased to be able to introduce her. Uh, she has published an extremely impressive, if I may say, monograph, Intersectional Discrimination. I've read it more than once, I've dipped into it, read it and dipped into it more than once. Um, that book examines uh, the gap between intersectional theory and discrimination law and analyzes the way in which that gap might be filled through law and it's incredibly fascinating and a real contribution to the legal and academic debate around that subject. Um, she's also presently doing work on a project equality law in times of crisis funded by the British Academy, and I've no doubt that will be really fascinating. Um, so I must introduce her, although I could speak a great deal more about her published work, much of which I've already read. Um, so her lecture tonight is titled Race Discrimination Without Racism, an extremely provocative question. Um, and she'll be looking at, as I understand it from her introductory 
uh, remarks on her paper, looking at that provocative question through insights on uh, jurisprudence in the sphere of equality law and the Equality Act 2010 itself. So thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the lecture. I'm going to turn my video off, but I will be looking at the Q&A uh, box and of course, listening to the lecture closely. So thank you very much. Karen, thank you so much for the kind introduction. You are a hero for all of us who work on equality law. So for you to chair this lecture, it's just the greatest privilege afforded to me. Thank you for all your work in the field and thank you for being an inspiration. Thank you as well to Sylvia Soteo and everyone at Current Legal Problems and UCL to have invited me to give this lecture. I'm very conscious that those who have preceded me have all been star academics who've delivered highly sophisticated and engaging lectures. To think that I belong to such an incredible list of lecturers is a real honor for which I'm extremely grateful to Sylvia and everyone at Current Legal Problems. And finally, thank you to everyone here tonight. It's a Thursday evening indistinguishable from any other in this very long lockdown in a very hard year. So I hope everyone is well, and I'm very grateful to each of you for choosing to spend your time listening to and thinking with me about things like race, racism, race discrimination, inequality law. So the title of today's lecture is Race Discrimination Without Racism. Let me begin by saying where that title comes from. So the Supreme Court of the UK was established in October 2009. It decided its first decision in December 2009. And that happened to be a decision on equality law. In fact, um, a decision under the Race Relations Act 1976. This was the first case of our and governing body of JFS school. And the Supreme Court in this case had found that the decision of JFS, a Jewish paid school, to give preference in case of oversubscription to Jews who fulfill the criteria of matrilineal descent constituted discrimination on the basis of ethnic origin. But the court was at pains to remind everyone that to be in breach of the Race Relations Act 1976 was not to be construed as being a racist in the popular sense of the term. In fact, as Lord Clark in his individual opinion clarified, overt racism such as the belief, and I quote, that God had made black people inferior and had destined them to live separately from whites, unquote, would be discrimination on racial grounds because the criteria was inherently racial and not because of the subjective state of mind of the discriminator. In other words, it was reliance on racial grounds that made race discrimination wrong and not the subjective mind of the discriminator. Even when the state of mind was racist, such as in Lord Clark's example, the case of JFS only confirmed one of the most important principles in UK equality law, that intention is irrelevant in proving discrimination. It is sufficient to show that the reason why something happened was race or ethnicity, and it is not necessary to show a bad intention behind it. But more importantly, for our purposes tonight, JFS also revealed what we thought was racism in the country, something subjective to do with individuals and their bigoted state of minds and mental processes. And since race discrimination was not about minds and mental processes, race discrimination and racism were to be considered different from one another. The purpose of today's lecture is to show that first, this understanding of racism to do with individual minds and mentality is too narrow. And that secondly, in turn, that it diminishes the link between racism and race discrimination as it, as it exists today in the contemporary context. So my twofold central argument is that racism today is broader, that it is structural in nature and is defined by the way the state governs the relationships between people. 
and that conceived this way, structural racism has an intimate link with race discrimination in that it helps identify and explain the way in which racism transpires today. Ultimately, my aim is not only to debunk the title of the lecture that race discrimination exists without racism, which I think is easy, uh, but to show precisely how the two are linked. Before I do that though, I want to locate this conversation in the present moment. The current discourse is replete with demands for the recognition of racism, whether it is Grenfell and Bindrush on the one hand to social movements like Black Lives Matter and the roads must fall on the other. The demand is no longer to see racism as something which inheres in the minds of some individual bad apples, but as something which involves the state at its center. So movements like defund and disband the police in the US, or more recently the kill the pill protests in the UK are not really demands to see that some police officers are the problem. They're not even claims of institutional racism, which in the UK has been limited to the collective behavior of an organization. They're bigger. And the demands are really to recognize how the state in the way that it governs is centrally implicated in racism by creating laws, conferring power and implementing justice. So for example, Black Lives Matter, which some may mistake as simply being about, about the deaths of black men, that too in the United States, casts itself as a broader movement, which describes its mission as to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the state. So what does this focus on the state mean? Sociologists and political theorists have an answer. For them, the emphasis on the state means that it is the state which regulates racial meaning within the societal structures. So for them, understanding racism is not about analyzing the actions of individual governments or individual political institutions on a specific issue. But as John Solomon says, and I quote, the complex totality of forces in British society, which have produced racialized political ideologies and practices, unquote. According to David Goldberg, the study of this complex totality of forces involves analyses of how states are implicated at four levels. First, at the level of definition. Second, in regulation. Third, through governance and fourth, through the management and mediation of racial matters. So Goldberg explains each of these as, for one, racial states define populations into racially identified groups. And they do so more or less formally through census taking, law, policy, through bureaucratic forms, administrative practices, etc. Second, Racial states regulate social, political, economic, legal, and cultural relations between those racially defined, invariably between white citizens and those identified as neither white nor citizens. Relatedly, third, racial states govern populations identified in explicitly racial terms. And fourth, racial states manage economically. They oversee economic life, shape the counters of racially conceived labor relations, structure the opportunities or possibilities of economic access and closure. Kohlberg suggests that this way of looking at states manages racial matters and, and, and managing racial matters reveals how states are what he calls at once implicated in the possibility of producing and reproducing racist ends and outcomes. So ultimately then, um, it is the openness of states to this possibility of producing and reproducing racist ends and outcomes that puts them at the heart of the structural view of racism. Now this understanding of racism um, within the structure and with racial states at, uh, is, is, is quite different from what we may call state racism, 
Um, so say racist states um, like Nazi Germany or apartheid South Africa um, had overt laws and policies which made them racist. Racial states or states which are open to structural racism uh, are open to the possibility of producing and reproducing racist ends and outcomes, but they do not rely on such blunt tools. Instead, racism is structural and is produced by imbuing the entire labyrinth of state in the way that it is imagined, executed, and effected with racial meaning and hierarchy. And in this scheme, law as an instrument of state is implicated in the possibility of producing racism, including through race discrimination law. In fact, the roots of race discrimination in the UK have been entangled in the process of racialization by the state, where the law prohibiting race discrimination under the Race Relations Act 1965 was conceived officially and in the state's own words to do with, the so with solving the problem of too many races, races as in the scare quotes in Britain. Thus, the first Race Relations Act went hand in hand with changes in immigration law in the 1960s to curb immigration of black and brown people from the new Commonwealth, such as the Caribbean and the subcontinent, as opposed to the old Commonwealth, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Anne Dummett, who has some of the most extensive ethnographic work on racism in England specifically of the 1960s and 70s, has shown how race discrimination was basically written into our immigration laws by conceiving race discrimination as a problem of too many races in Britain and immigration law as solving that problem. So in Dummett's work, we see in careful detail how successive governments, politicians, media had constructed the dominant narrative of race equality or anti-racism as being about the absence of non-white people from the UK, which seems to me a view unquestionably akin to racism, but now simply repackaged as immigration policy. And through these kinds of analyses from a social, political, cultural, and also economic perspective, we come to appreciate what we mean by racism which has stayed at its center and is structural in nature. It is far from how we conceive racism as the Supreme Court in JFS said in the popular sense, as something just about the bigoted views of individuals. Structural racism, as I've tried to explain, runs far, far deeper than that. For the rest of the lecture, I want to show that structural racism features in discrimination law both in cases of direct and indirect discrimination. And I'll take four examples, two each of direct and indirect discrimination to show how structural racism seems to explain what is at play in all of these failed cases. These are all recent cases from the last decade and I think they show rather well the more complex face of racism, which is not subsumed by direct racial abuse, racial slurs, racial prejudice informing the decisions of individuals. So let's take the first case. This is the 2017 Court of Appeal decision in Bianca Durant, a chief constable. And this is what happened in Durant. So after a night out in the city of Bristol, the appellant who was a black woman was accompanied by her white friend who was also a woman and they were looking for a taxi. They approached um, a taxi rank and they were racially abused by the taxi marshal. So it was the appellant who was targeted, who was a black woman. At this point, her white friend confronted the taxi marshal, which led to the two of them being seized and assaulted by him. And when her white friend tried to retaliate by hitting him, it was, pol it was police which was arriving at that point. Uh, but instead of reach reaching for the white friend, they reached straight for the appellant who was a black woman and arrested her. It was only after some persuasion from the taxi marshal that the police arrested the white friend. And it was still the, the appellant who was handcuffed despite any resistance on her part and then put in a police van, which is referred to as the cage, while the white friend was sat in front of the van while the police officers had the white friend sat with, um, with, with them and without handcuffs. 
And on the way to the police station, the appellant was unable to balance herself because she was handcuffed and was banged and thrown around in the cage while the police officers in the front laughed and joked about it. She was then made to wait in the cage before being taken out and processed at the police station. When released, she was asked to return for an interview on a later date. When she attended voluntarily and as the CCTV confirmed as politely as one could, she was searched and placed in a cell again as she waited for her legal representative to arrive. Meanwhile, her white friend too arrived at the police station for the interview, but was asked to wait in a consultation room. She was not searched and was provided with magazines and was allowed to call a babysitter. Now at the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Sales agreed that almost everything in the case was direct race discrimination. From the appellant being targeted at arrest to being handcuffed, except for her treatment at the police station on the day of the interview when she was detained in a cell and her white fr friend was in a consultation room with magazines and access to a babysitter. He confirmed that the difference was fully and satisfactorily ex explicable by reason of the different ways in which the appellant and her friend presented themselves. So while the appellant was treated in accordance with normal procedures applicable to everyone regardless of their race, her friend was given special dispensation from normal procedures because she appeared to be visibly upset and in a fragile state. Now it is good to know that the police followed normal procedures applicable to everyone regardless of their race. But the question that arises is, why was the normal procedure followed for a black woman and dispensation granted for a white woman? In fact, why was the black woman perceived to be less fragile and more in control despite being in an objectively worse situation, having been previously mistreated and misjudged by the police officers at the very same police station in comparison to the white woman? Why is detention in a cell and handcuffing deemed less worse and normal for the black woman while being asked to wait in a consultation room without being served, searched, reserved for her white friend? What kind of stereotypes and per perceptions about black criminality and white fragility inform these normal procedures and the day-to-day -day workings of the police? So the question was not where the normal procedures were followed but the reason why normal procedures and dispensations from those procedures appeared to be based on race, and in this case, both race and gender. Once you ask that question and see it through that lens, Durant seems to be showing us that normal procedures seem to have race encoded into them, such that the routine operation of those structures fails to reveal any differential treatment based on race when they are even when they are applied differentially. Now you may be wondering why I don't call this kind of case a case of institutional racism, a rather more popular term in the UK than structural racism. You may recall the term um, that institutional racism was introduced by Sir William McPherson in his 1999 report on uh, Stephen Lawrence's murder, where he defined it as, and I quote, the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture, or ethnic origin. He said that it can be seen as or detected in processes, attitudes, and behavior which amounted to discrimination through unwitting prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness, and racial stereotyping, which disadvantaged minority ethnic people. Two things are important here. First, that institutional racism is after all considered unwitting. And secondly, that it is ultimately pegged to individual actions and attitudes in an organization. As we saw in the previous section, racism, as, as I've just mentioned, is, is, is a bit different. It's not unwitting. It is well considered and well managed. It is also not to do with individuals, but with the state itself. It is thus vastly broader than the notion of institutional racism. 
And here I find it helpful to borrow from Coretta Phillips's framework, who describes institutional racism as existing at a meso level between the micro level practices of individuals and the macro level, which involves what she calls structural forces beyond individual practices and institutional processes. So the implication is that institutional racism as it applies to a particular situation such as the police fails to get at racism embedded in the very scaffolding of modern policing centered around inherently racialized framings for example of stop and search traffic stops arrests use of force and deaths in contact with police it is a modern construct because it is not simply a relic of the past, but of recent making, with the state's contemporaneous investment in the use of its power to embed racialized meanings into seemingly neutral laws and policies in new and imaginative ways. So for example, Liberty and Stopwatch have recently questioned the freshly minted offense of driving when unlawfully in the UK under the Immigration Act 2016. They argue that it potentially affects anyone appearing to be an immigrant or an outsider, that is all non-white persons who are already twice as likely to be stopped in their vehicles as compared to whites. But such laws are not neutral laws to begin with. Racialization is encoded within them in the way that they are conceived in reference to a racialized understanding of immigration and non-white people in particular, who are in seed and as, as, as being in the constant need of being checked and controlled for the suspicion of being unlawfully present in the country. Such is the result of the hostile environment policies which have coincided almost with the adoption and enforcement of the Equality Act 2010 in the last 10 years. And Almost since the adoption of the first Race Relations Act 1965, the trajectory of UK equality law seems to be continuing to be inextricably linked to the message of anti-immigration. The key difference here now is that the message is spread out more widely and given effect to not just in immigration laws, but law, policy and governance more generally covering areas from criminal law and policing to access to housing and driving. Racism is thus more structurally rooted than before. Yet it is more difficult to extract structural racism now, given that it is coded into the normal procedures, classified as neutral and has nothing to do with race. But the inherent racialization of these normal procedures is borne out immediately when they are applied directly in reference to race, as was the case in Durand. And here is how we see that structural racism does not immediately or always translate into indirect discrimination, observable only in effect, but persists as direct discrimination itself, when discriminatory treatment is openly based on racial grounds, but ultimately normalized. This is also borne out, for example, in Stop and Search, which was most recently upheld as lawful by the Supreme Court in its 2015 case, Roberts and Commissioner of Police. Let's take a look at some statistics before I look into Roberts. Blacks are nine and a half times more likely to be stopped and searched than white people. A disparity which is known to be what the Supreme Court in Roberts called particularly stark in the case of suspicionless stop and search, which is covered under section 60 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994. And according to Home Office's own data, 38% of searches in 2017-18 involved black people, when blacks comprise less than 3.3% of the country's population. This is not a mere statistical disparity to contend with, to understand why blacks are treated differently um, than whites. But to understand how the power for suspicion less stop and search has come to be linked directly to race. And once again, to interrogate the ideas of criminality of black lives and black bodies 
that frame the very reason these powers come to exist and the way they are applied to black people because they are black. Instead, what the Supreme Court did in Roberts when faced with an individual claimant, Mrs. Roberts, who clutched her hand back nervously when confronted with a police officer for not having paid a bus fare, was to validate that it was right for the police to restrain her to the ground, handcuff and forcibly search her. Uh, but they didn't stop at that. They also upheld the validity of the criminal law provision which allowed that. And in the 19 pages which occupy the Supreme Court's decision, Lady Hale and Lord Reed explain at length what they thought made Mrs. Roberts's treatment to be in accordance with law as required by Article 8, which is on the right to privacy of the European Convention on Human Rights. But they declined to consider her claim of race discrimination under Article 14 on the right to equality under the European Convention, which was, in fact, the heart of the complaint. Instead, they unapologetically went on to state, and I quote, gangs are largely composed of young people from Black, and minority ethnic groups, and that mostly young black lives will be saved if there is less gang violence in London and some other cities." Unquote. What is disturbing about these statements is that they take a wholly patronizing view of the black community when the community has consistently advocated against these black in these police powers and instead advocated for a public health approach to knife crime and gang violence and generally greater community oriented in initiatives to uplift those involved. But what is even more disturbing is that these statements were made despite the court having refused an appeal on grounds of race discrimination explicitly and thus having divorced itself from the subject matter. In fact, the court below had refused to take into account the research and data on suspicion list of search, the, the data that I, that I quoted to you before, because it considered such data controversial and giving rise to difficult issues of interpretation. The Supreme Court, on the other hand, did not just not consult this evidence, but went a step further to profess its unfounded views on the black community and its experience of stop and search. I want to take two final examples of indirect discrimination to explain them through the lens of structural racism. Both of these examples were decided last year by the Court of Appeal and they're currently pending before the Supreme Court as I understand. One is the mini cab drivers case, which challenged Sadi Khan's policy disqualifying mini cab drivers from congestion charge exemption in London. And the other is the right to rent case, which challenged the hostile environment policy of landlords having to do right to rent checks on pro prospective tenants to confirm that they are lawfully present in the UK. Now, both of these challenges failed at that stage. Uh, but though it's not about what was decided in these cases that matters as much, but what was happening in these cases as cases of structural racism that I want to explore. So in both the cases, what was at stake was a neutral policy which had no reference to race or ethnic or national origin on the face of it. But the contention was that, was that these policies were in, indirectly discriminatory because they particularly disadvantage the black, Asian, minority ethnic population in the UK. In the mini cab drivers case, it turned out that 94% of the mini cab drivers were BAME and would have lost about 10% of their net annual income because they could no longer be eligible for its being exempt from the congestion charge in London. In contrast, 88% of drivers of hackney carriages, or as we call them, just black cabs or taxis, were white and were exempt from this charge. Similarly, on the other hand, the right to rent case, um, there was clear evidence before the court that a vast majority of landlords just found it easy to simply rent to those who are white or had the right accent or had an English name than someone who was non-white, including potentially non-white British citizens, let alone migrants. 
both the courts agreed that these types of cases were plainly cases of indirect discrimination. The question before the courts then was whether they could still be justified on a proportional basis. But the courts agreed that the policies had legitimate aims. In the Minicab's case, the aim was to reduce traffic and hence pollution in inner city London. And in the right to rent case, the purpose was to reduce illegal immigration by making it difficult for those here illegally to access public life generally. Both the cases agreed that the policies were suitably connected to achieving these aims and that they were necessary in achieving these aims. The only question that remained was whether the policies struck the right balance between the potential benefit versus the potential discrimination in these cases. And here too, both the courts agreed that although BAME populations were undoubtedly affected by these policies, the policies were still beneficial. In one case for reducing traffic in London and in another case for reducing illegal migrants in the UK. Now there's nothing prime of SI troubling about the analyses in these cases, but that is exactly what is troubling about them that a proper application of race discrimination law sustains rather than addresses clear discriminatory impact on the UK's pain population. So although Lady Justice Simler in the Minicab's case described at no less than five points that the impact of Sadiq Khan's policy was stark and particularly troubling, these are phrases that, that she used, Nothing about her analysis of indirect discrimination seems to alleviate the inequality, whereby at best 31%, that is about 35,000, and at worst 94%, which is about 106,000 pay minicab drivers were going to lose 10% of their net annual income and be relegated, as they had argued, to second class citizenship, literally at the margins of their own city, London. It is useful to quickly unpack why this happens. There are a couple of explanations. First, it seems that net gain from policies which aim to tackle some of the biggest problems of our times, such as urban overgrowth, climate change, or even the pandemic, can be easily established because action to prevent these crises is just so incredibly important that almost any action satisfies this criteria. But why is that? I think it is because net gain is also achieved often by sacrificing the lives of those who are worse off than others, often racial and ethnic minorities. It is their pre-existing disadvantage which makes them disproportionately vulnerable to negative impact of any change in policy, which can otherwise be absorbed by those who are not so vulnerable. Unless we recognize this very fact and refuse to accept net gain predicated on the dispensability of lives of minorities, we are accepting that discrimination law will continue to sustain race discrimination. But there is a principle to recognize this pre-existing vulnerability which allows raising the standard of scrutiny in a case before the court because the case is based on the suspectness because the case is based on a suspect ground. So the suspectness of a ground at stake means that certain kinds of impact based on grounds such as race or sex um, is going to be considered inherently problematic for us to treat it lightly. Um, this is a well-recognized principle in discrimination law. And yet this principle seems to have played no role in these two cases. To be sure, both the cases cite the principle that race discrimination deserved a higher level of scrutiny, but they did nothing with it. In fact, in both the cases, courts seem to replace this principle by another principle, one which attached extraordinary deference to democratically elected policymakers and legislators. It is here that we come to appreciate what is really at stake at structural racism and why it falls through the cracks of race discrimination law. Deference in principle runs counter to the structural view of race discrimination 
which sees state as centrally implicated in governing the existing race relations, which maintain the status quo where non-white and non-British people fare worse than others. A structural view would thus warn against a principle of judicial deference exclusively applicable to the state, especially the government, which is particularly susceptible to majoritarian impulses which exclude racial minorities. At the very least, the structural view of racism would not allow such a principle to be one on which a case turns. A structural view of racism would also discourage judges to do not concede to race discrimination, such as in the right to rent case, where, where, where it seemed that, um, sorry, I'll, I'll come back to this. I think the structural view would not uh, would would encourage judges to not concede race discrimination, such as in the right to rent case, where they, where before Lord Hickenbottom there, there was scant evidence that the policy was actually effective. It would also bar judges, I would um, think, such as in the right to rent case again, from considering the parliament um, or in fact the mayor's awareness of the potential for race discrimination to be a reason for letting race discrimination stand. The courts in these cases seem to think that since race discrimination did not appear to be more than what was intended by the policymakers, it was probably fine. Now it is useful to take a step back here. In the end, the global concern with these types of cases is this, that the discussion in them seems entirely removed from how race discrimination manifests itself today that it is in fact these types of cases which signify racism today and not cases where there is either overt intention of, of an individual person or an unwitting decision make, maker such as the government which ends up discriminating. But structural racism has well-drawn and purposefully crafted policies of the state, which is a state which is self-aware and well-intentioned about the discrimination it is perpetrating. This discrimination resides in the way the state ideates or, or it imagines itself, operates and manifests itself, both as an idea and in terms of its everyday governance. In the mini cab driver's case, this involved the mayor of London's acute awareness of the policy being particularly damaging towards the life conditions and citizenship of mini cab drivers in London, a price he was willing to pay to address traffic congestion without having to show that a different course could be pursued to achieve the aim. It was in fact mini cab drivers themselves who were asked to show what the, the other options could be as if governance, especially to avoid any impact based on their race or ethnicity were up to them. The deflection of attention from the state seems only to have been complete by total immunizing of the state from scrutiny. In the right to rent case, this involved the state's own view of itself as principally closed off to immigration and only open to a certain kind of migrant who can withstand an otherwise hostile environment experienced in the mundane dealings of day-to-day -day life, such as accessing housing, employment, healthcare, etc. The fact that the state effectively made border police out of landlords, employers, and healthcare providers is then the state's prerogative because it is essentially to do with how the state itself sees and operationalizes. Discrimination laws, especially as enforced by the courts, seem to be able to do nothing about it. So to conclude, I've tried to show that race discrimination in cases often involves structural racism beneath them, and that an understanding of the way structural racism operates can be crucial to unearthing both direct and indirect forms of discrimination. What I have done is largely conceptual. I've tried to reorient a discrimination lawyer's view of race discrimination by providing a substantive underpinning to it one which is linked to structural racism and does not conceive of race discrimination as aberrational, episodic, individualistic, or unwitting.
but as something coded into structures, especially structures that are to do with the state itself. Now, I know this is not a small suggestion. The dominant discourse on how law and politics in the UK work seems to be terribly shy of talking about racism. But importantly, race discrimination law so seems almost normatively empty, at least in as much as it has to do with live issues of race and racism. But I think therein lies the opportunity. The open definitions of direct and indirect discrimination, I think, leave ample room for structural racism to be recognized alongside more straightforward cases of race discrimination. The irrelevance of intention, the criteria of discrimination law that I mentioned earlier on in the lecture, I think that irrelevance of intention is also very helpful and it's another opportunity to actually have uh, structural racism recognized through race discrimination. So I think we do have a choice. On the one hand, we can choose to continue with our formalistic view of law, one which does not draw a link between race discrimination and racism. On the other hand, we can use structural racism as an evaluative lens for understanding, arguing, and responding to race discrimination cases. And it is perhaps that leap of faith that we owe ourselves as discrimination lawyers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, incredibly interesting. Uh, really, you know, really made me think about the way in which um, equality law works. And it makes me understand the title of the question. I have to say the title of the lecture. I was somewhat bemused. I thought, well, how, race discrimination without racism, how does that work? And the analysis that you've provided to us really explains that. And I have already mentioned your book, but I just want to link it. I and mean, of course, it's a very different topic, but it does show the way in which our very formalistic approach to equality law. I mean, obviously in the context of intersectional law, uh, intersectional discrimination adding other problems but the formalistic approach that we adopt to equality law has the possibility and indeed the way you describe it really the probability that it entrenches racism in the context of your your discussion and I think that's really helpful to understand within the context of a racial state as you describe it the laws that we have in particular in relation to direct and indirect discrimination simply don't address structural racism and indeed may operate to entrench it. And so that was really came across clearly to me. I hope I've understood it and not done it a great injustice, but it really came across really very powerfully. And so it was incredibly interesting. Thank you. Now I do have questions for you and I know you've agreed to take some questions. I'm going to, I'm afraid, abuse my position as chair and ask the first question, a question that I'm um, interested in hearing your thoughts about, uh, and that's um, the issue of racial harassment. So you spoke in particular about the way in which uh, the law addressed or, or the prohibitions on direct and indirect discrimination addressed structural racism or, or not, as the case may be. And I wondered if you've got any thoughts about that in particular in relation to racial harassment, which has been something that's been fairly prominent um, in terms of you know, discussions around this issue in, in recent years. Thank you, thank you so much, Karen. You understood it perfectly and, and how could it not be given the fact that so many of these cases that I'm, that I'm thinking about are cases that you have argued. But I'll also answer your question on racial harassment by referring to something that you argued. And I think racial harassment also has e equally the possibility of being interpreted via the lens of structural racism. And I think, in fact, it is more important to see racial harassment via structural racism than even direct and indirect forms of discrimination. Mm -hmm. So I think what's interesting about racial harassment is that unlike sexual harassment, which is recently, especially after Me Too, been understood very much as a matter of structures, 
that what happens is not simply a case of um, uh, uh, power relations between a male boss and a female secretary, but about the structures which are put in place, whether it's about training, whether it's about complaint mechanisms, whether it's about redressal, whether it's about changing the culture and how colleagues relate to one another. None of that has happened for racial harassment. And much as people try, this structural understanding seems to evade. So for example, mm -hmm. um, one of the cases that, that, that you argued, Pesong, which, is, which might be interesting for the audience to know about, this was the EAT's case. Um, and and, and at, at the Employment Appeal Tribunal, the case before um, them was about whether to overturn what is the classical rule of third party liability that the employer, um, cannot be held liable for uh, harassment which happens between two people, right? So if somebody racially harasses an employee and that somebody doesn't happen to be the employer, the employer is not meant to be liable in that case. So there's no third party liability for the employer unless you can show that employer's conduct was itself racially motivated. And and, and that's, that's, that's telling because Clearly, what you need to show is that not that the employer intended to do something which was racially included by not investigating that complaint or such, but whether to see whether the employer who is on a different power relations, or who has, a, in, in, in terms of the power differential, at a much higher pedestal than the employee to put in place structures to have prevented and to address racial uh, harassment. None of that seems to happen. But I think a structural view of racism to say that the state must reconceive of how third party liability must, must take place, especially in the context of harassment, it seems, it seems to me the only way. That seems to have happened for sexual harassment, but not for racial discrimination. I think it's high time, but I'll leave it up to you to argue it before the courts. I wish. <laughs> I've done my best and got nowhere so far, so there we are. We'll leave it to the academics. Um, I've got another, I've got a couple of questions for you, um, and I'm, I'm looking, I'm reading them as I'm speaking, so if they're a bit disjoint, if I'm not articulating them very well, I hope the audience will forgive me. Um, an interesting qu question here about immigration policy, one that I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, would you extend your analysis of racism repackaged as immigration policy to cases of citizenship stripping, such as in the Begum case? I see. Uh, in Shamima Begum's case, I suppose, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think there's there's a lot to unpack with with citizenship issues, which is which is to me as somebody who also works on the, on, on the side of on, on international law about what is happening at at that level, and to have seen what could have happened had there been. Uh, a possibility for her to reclaim citizenship elsewhere because a different view would have triggered. But I think structural racism would be open to thinking about citizenship rules exactly in the same way. I think it would expose how states imagine citizenship as a space where racial meaning is given to who accesses and how. Right, so often the states which don't have these dual nationality structures are the ones who fall through the cracks of not being able to access. If you don't have citizenship here, you don't get citizenship there. Right, so these are very much at the international plane decisions which state make with like-minded states whose citizens they would like to have give, be given access to dual citizenship. And Shamima, Shamima Vegan didn't have that. So I think at a very high level, we are absolutely talking about subjecting citizenship laws to structural racism. Um, I, I, I would hope that, that, that that's helpful. I think a lot of critical legal scholars in international law do devote their attention to thinking about it in this way. Um, and, and I hope more of more of discrimination law can be brought into it. Can I quickly mention though one thing, which I don't know the, uh, if, if everybody in the audience would know, I always find it fascinating every time I turn to it. The connection between citizenship and race discrimination is just so fraught when you look at uh, the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which is one of the first international human rights treaties. And Article 1 of that basically just keeps aside the question of nationality and citizenship and says, well, this convention applies to anything other than that. And this 
citizenship exceptionalism is so deep in international law. Um, it's, it's amazing because when you look at the Convention on the Re Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which we call CERT, it's one of the most powerful statements on non-discrimination. You read the preamble and their sense of talking about apartheid, Holocaust, it's, it's real. They perceive what is wrong, but they never see that this is a problem at the level of immigration or citizenship or nationality. And I think that exceptionalism is so embedded that unless we sort of upturn those kind of exceptionalism and really subject it to subject those exceptions to a structural view, we'll, we'll get we'll get nowhere. So thank you for, for the question, whoever asked. OK, I've got another question. It's coming from a, a slightly different angle. Um, it's looking at the question of structural racism, but is also um, inviting consideration of the question whether or not that takes uh, place at a deeper psychological level rather than at a superficial institutional level. Uh, so the, the person asking the question is inviting reflection on the sort of thinking that was done last year after the killing of George Floyd and the sort of uh, greater training, thinking, um, sort of awareness raising about racism and whether or any lessons can be learned from that in considering whether or not, you know, wh where one might go or not, as the case may be with structural racism. Thanks, thanks, Karen, and thanks, thanks for the question. Um, who's whoever is asking this? So I think we cannot negate uh, how individual minds work, um, and I think the individual based model of discrimination has a role to play. I think it's useful to understand at an individual level how people are reasoning um, and to understand how stereotypes sort of infiltrate that reasoning. I'm interested in those reasoning processes as well as much as another person. But I think, and there is a big body of literature um, which has empirically studied the role of trainings in sexual harassment and sex discrimination in the US, which shows that no matter how much we train, so this may not be a very popular view, but sociologists who study this and empiricists who actually go out and study them in the field seem to think that trainings only go so far and they become more of a managerial exercise for companies to tick box that look, we have told people to change. What, what else could we possibly do? And they're like a field trip. They're like, a, they, they, they become sort of um, taking an open day out with, with, with your um, colleagues and, and, and they become one of those exercises which have become very popular on social media. You take a step forward, you recognize your privilege. I think those conversations are useful at an individual level as to how we relate to one another as people in the society, but it doesn't quite help the kind of cases which I'm talking about, which are about the broad structures which are put in place, right? So the hostile environment policy of the last decade is literally imagining what we are as a country differently. It's at that level, I think, that we need to think of structural racism. So I think these are not mutually exclusive projects of thinking at an individual level and thinking about the structural level. They, they, they do interact and they have a space, but I think I, I find the, the framework that I mentioned of Coretta Phillips, that it's it's about, you know, the micro, meso and, and, and uh, macro levels to think about individual institutional and structural, very helpful. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, I'm going to ignore, but I'm gonna let you know, there's lots of entries in the Q&A saying you're amazing and the lecture's fantastic and so on, but I won't go through all those, but you've got some marvelous comments in here. They're absolutely wonderful. Um, I've got another question. Um, uh, and this is uh, an interesting question. It's from Colm Okanady, so it would be, is the essential problem that racism is so structurally embedded that applying race discrimination law in its full proper rigor would see the courts intervening in state policy and practice everywhere, and that would be politically unsustainable? And if so, what do we do Column's asking, what do we do about the court's role? What role does it have in that context? Yeah, so thanks, 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 Column, for being here and for, for the question. Of course, 
you you hit the nail on its head everything in the uk comes down to law and politics debate and i think this this one does as well um so i didn't do a good job in the lecture but the paper tries to navigate the hurdle that you raise in this way it says that in the end so i concede in the paper that race discrimination actually is after all about individual cases of discrimination and i don't mean individual in the sense that individual as a person these are instantiations they are examples right so there is always a discrete policy law it could be even a big law um like the suspicion less stop and search power in section 60 but it has to be a very specific thing in the end right we're not changing everything when we're trying to target a specific policy or something that's done by a specific policy maker or or an implementation or a policy decision taken right so i think judges can well be within their remit to be applying race discrimination law correctly if they try to just see that in that instantiation of race discrimination through structural racism and to try to unravel uh, what exactly is happening in that particular case through the structural racism lens right so how do we see that it isn't exactly um the case of one appellant against one respondent but exactly what are the structures in place who is building them how are they ideated how are they imagined and how are they operationalized right to not to not some kind of a blame game but to really try to understand the process of racialization here which i find to be a very interesting concept which sociologists bring up how are these processes basically making us stick to who we are in terms of our races whatever the reality of this races are are we basically giving meaning in how we think of law by putting on each of us in boxes right how exactly does that process of racialization happen in these individual instances so i think this is similar to what the south african court does in terms of contextualizing uh adjudication and i don't think that's overstepping the mark it's just to see that something which is as live as discrimination which is some it's not a problem created by law per se although law may be one of the reasons one of the instantiations of it if we think of race discrimination as something which is occurring sort of outside of courtrooms you just have to go outside of courtrooms to understand it so i think a proper structure of having access to expert evidence being a, the ability to read sociological economic e- expert evidence as something accessible and not treating expert evidence as i don't know what to do with statistics i think suspicion let's stop and search the statistics are so obvious i i think maybe basic training in statistics will help to understand that so i think these are very accessible things which other courts elsewhere have attempted they're not breaches of the adjudicative role i think courts can be very serious about their legal job to be interpreting that law but that legal job can't be seen as having nothing to do with the problem at hand because discrimination is not a legal problem to start Okay, I'm going to ask you this question, and if you want to say don't be ridiculous, I'm not answering that question. Then I have another one up my sleeve, but I it is is there in my Q and A box, um, and the question is: To what extent do you see structural racism to be linked to capitalism? Now you may say, sorry, write that write that PhD yourself. I'm not engaging, but if you want to say something, you have the opportunity. <laughs> Oh god I'm so glad you bring this up Karen and whoever is asking this question you're very welcome to 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 get in touch and do this PhD with me you're very welcome. I would love love that um it's it's so crucial and I and I and I I'm and I'm guilty of eliding that point all I have done in this case is just to recognize say Sivanandan's excellent scholarship which my marxist friends have very very helpfully pointed out that no no work in on structural racism in this country will be complete by looking at um the the sociological and the cultural studies works of Stuart Hall um Catherine Hall and all 
they, they were so clear about looking at racism and capitalist structures together, right? And it all started looking at racism and, and imperialism, right? So the 1950s and 60s, that was really the time where, where the two were coming to be linked and studied together. So I don't mean to divorce the two, um, and 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 I I hope there is another paper, another possibility to be really bringing out the 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 economic bases of structural racism in in neoliberalism, political economies, capitalism, all kinds of political economies, right? Um, and 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 I don't think it's just capitalism. I think there are other problematic spaces where other kinds of uh, political imaginations exist, which are deeply structurally racist as well. So I think a very broad um, survey or analysis of how racism goes hand in hand with how the economic structures operate is much needed. Uh, maybe you and I can do that together, whoever asks. Well, as it happens, I'm doing a master's at the moment for a hobby in social and political theory. And my uh, dissertation is on race and Marxism. So there you are. I'm going to be ringing you up and asking you for the, all those papers and to discuss it with you. Anyway, fantastic question and brilliant answer. And I'm going to steal the answer and get, email you immediately so that I can get a good grade in my um, uh, uh, dissertation. Um, just one more question. I hope you don't mind me just asking you one more, Shreya. We've kept you for a very long time, but if you're happy to take one more, uh, it's a completely different issue, although very important in the context of your, uh, your presentation. Um, do you think that taking more positive steps to ensure diversity in the judiciary would be positive in terms of progressing uh, advancement in relation to law and racism, challenging a racial state and structural racism? Well, that's a no brainer. I can only say yes to that. But I mean, it seems that every generation of equality lawyers seem to begin and end with, with that. I mean, Bob Heppel's um, excellent, very critical analysis of, of, of the first generation of equality, uh, of race equality legislations, right? Race Relations Act 65, 68 and 76. He ended up making this point almost entirely through that time that, well, if you're going to have judges who have very little idea of how racism actually transpires, they're going to be able to not see how it transpires in race discrimination law. So he had recognized that link and he thought that the link could not be appreciated by an undiverse bench. Um, so I, I think that's fair, um, but I also think that we can't wait for, for the benches uh, or judges to be looking more diverse. I think just building enough uh, of material for them to take and to take on board and to to press them to take on board is the only way out. I mean, they're intelligent enough to to be able to uh, to be persuaded to read something, to understand something, and to bring to to be open to certain kinds of evidence. I think we. I would hope that we are at a point where a, 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 a more diverse bench can 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 automatically do this but i won't pin my hopes to suddenly um, you know people looking different and just getting structural racism i think um i think diversity serves all kinds of ends and not just the end of social justice so i think i would hope for gender gender diversity race diversity because that matters but I wouldn't necessarily hope that the Im immediately, if, if there are more Rabinder Singh, that then everybody would suddenly recognize structural racism because, because I think we would still need openness to understanding structural racism. And it may or may not be that people who look different, who are from gender uh, diverse backgrounds or from fame backgrounds may be open to it, uh, but we, we, that that's not the only reason why they should make uh, benches, I would think. Okay, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And the Q&A was incredibly interesting too. So I know we will be very, very grateful. We've kept you longer than we said we would. So especially grateful that you were kind enough to stay on. Um, absolutely fascinating. I fear I might be in touch, Shreya, sorry. 
you. But, but anyway, it was absolutely marvellous. Thank you. And I, as I think we've already said, the paper will be available um, and there will be a, a, an uploading of the video in due course. I don't know if you're going to say anything, Sylvia, um, by Just way Just to of... say thank you to, to Shreya for the wonderful lecture and to you, Karen, for, for masterful chairing and to everybody who stayed on and engaged so, so deeply with the ideas. Um, have a wonderful evening, everyone, and thank you very much. <laughs>